So I'm going to, I'm going to, one of the things we discovered when the book came out and we started talking about it, there are a few things that we discovered that we hadn't realized because we've been talking to the same group of really attentive people for a long time. So now it's more broadly out there and, and there's some things that we, we, we have to take a step back and be a little bit more basic. So the first thing is most people have an understanding that there is some kind of emerging disease problem in the world somewhere. I mean, mostly they think it's in Africa, but uh, we know it's a problem somewhere. But most people don't realize how large the problem is. Most people do not realize that what we call high probability, low impact, so the average little breakouts all over the world, every year now are costing the world a trillion dollars a year in production losses and treatment costs. And that's more than the GDP of all but 15 countries on the planet. The, this new Global Commission on Adaptation just suggested that the world spend $1.8 trillion over the next 10 years to adapt to climate change globally. But emerging infectious diseases were never mentioned in their discussion because there are three things that most people, including people like Bill Gates, don't understand that we ought to. And the first thing is, most people do not understand that there's a direct connection between climate change and disease. That's why the Gates Foundation gives money for, for diseases from, with one hand and money for climate change with the other hand, and they don't realize that there's any connection between them. Now we know, this is this, the shameless self-promotion part of this, the talk, that's done. So what we've discovered is, oh, Damn, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, last year we could do it this way, this year we can't. All right, I'm sorry. So, it's costing the world a trillion dollars a year. It's really expensive. And here are things that people don't know that they should know. The first is that there's this direct connection between climate change and disease, blah, blah. What we, what we, were, we have discovered over the last few years in pulling together 40 years of, of research is that most people think that Diseases cannot jump from one host to another. They can't move from wild animals to domestic animals, wild animals to humans, unless there is the evolution of some specific new genetic material information that allows them to do that. It turns out that's not true. It turns out that, in fact, all most pathogens need is the opportunity to come into contact with a host that's already susceptible but has never been exposed before. And that means that the, the potential for emerging diseases is enormous. And the ability for these things to occur rapidly is much greater than we ever thought. And it turns out that not, not only today, but throughout evolutionary history, climate change has been the primary catalyst for emerging diseases. And the reason for this is so simple. A friend of mine just said, the answer is so simple, we missed it for 100 years, and that is, Climate change simply allows things to move around. And that's all pathogens need is new opportunity that just allows things to move around. Turns out, of course, that urbanization and globalization amplify that process. Okay, number two, most people don't realize that cities are a problem, not a solution to climate change. There's a large group of people who believe that what we need to solve the problems of climate change are just bigger, 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 more and more densely populated cities, and that will solve the whole problem. Not true. And there, there's a primary reason for this, and that is human history, like most of human history, like most of evolutionary history in general, is the following. When conditions change, run away. If you don't like the way things are where you live, run away find a place where conditions are okay. If you can't run away, try to cope. If you can't cope, you die. That's a very succinct statement of evolutionary history. Sedentism associated with, with domestication, agriculture, becoming urbanization, changed our evolutionary trajectory beginning about 11,000 years ago. They took away our evolutionary escape route. We trapped ourselves. So we now no longer have that evolutionary, traditional evolutionary escape route 
even though we still have the impulse to run away from trouble. Um, this is a picture of sunrise at Angkor Wat. This is a, was a beautiful, wonderful, highly modern city that was destroyed by a relatively minor climate change fluctuation. It's a series of drought years, heavy monsoon years, drought years, heavy monsoon years. The monsoons broke the water system. Then the drought came. They repaired the water system as a static system rather than a flowing system. Then the monsoons hit again. And after about 40 years, they said, the hell with it, and left. So there are no dead bodies in Angkor Wat. There's no sign of conflict. They just left. They said, we can't cope with this. We're leaving. The problem is they didn't move someplace else and rebuild this kind of massive civilization. The Khmer are still around. But this, they, never, this never, they never achieved that level again. Anthropocene cities, in other words, today's cities, cities since about 1756, have a number of features that make them especially susceptible to emerging disease outbreaks. The first of it is that they're really warm, which makes them really nice incubators for microbes and other things as well. They require a constant flow of materials in and out, in and out, which means that the potential for pathogens to be introduced, to be brought in, is really high. They have high population densities with low kinship, so you don't know who your neighbors are. You don't know who to trust. You don't cooperate as well with them. You then get to the point where you think that this problem is somebody else's to deal with. There's an extreme division of labor and specialization in cities, which means that in many, many cases, we now have a relatively small number of people doing particular jobs, which means that if this person gets sick, the scanners at the grocery stores don't work until that person gets well, because we've economized to the point that we don't have backups anymore. A relatively minor outbreak that would, say, make 20% of the workforce sick in Budapest for a month would grind the economy of Budapest to a halt. Cities provide safe environments for zoonotic diseases, as diseases that can be transmitted from wildlife to humans. We call them urban green spaces, and we think these are really important, wonderful things to have. But it turns out that urban green spaces are, in fact, the places that zoonotic diseases and their reservoirs hang out. So like everything else in, in biology, there's no free lunch. And there are, only, there are no benefits without costs. And finally, the lifestyle, the unusually high level standard of living enjoyed by a lot of people in large cities is always supported by a poor, undereducated, underserved class of people who are virtually invisible to public services. And they're the ones who wash our clothes, clean our dishes, prepare our food, clean our toilets, do our laundry, take care of people in hospitals, and they are almost completely invisible to the public health system. So cities are not necessarily, they're really not the great thing that we thought they were. And finally, most people have no sense that we can actually be proactive about anything to do with climate change. And most people believe that the best we can do, they think that everything that's happening is unpredicted, and it's a huge surprise, and the best we can do is try to react more and more rapidly. But the reality is, that's not true. There are many things we could do proactively. We just don't do them. And there are a number of reasons for that. In the area of climate change and emerging diseases, the policy protocol for being proactive is what we call finding them before they find us, or anticipate to mitigate, is called the DAMA protocol, which stands for document, assess, monitor, and act. Um, now, anticipate to mitigate means if we know what's coming at us, we can buy time while searching for solutions. So for example, in 2007, when African swine fever broke out in domestic pigs in Georgia, 
every country in Europe should have begun planning to try to mitigate the possibility of an outbreak. Nobody did anything. Now we're faced with a global pandemic of African swine fever that is going to, the current estimates are that 25% of pork production around the world will be lost in the next year because we did nothing, even though we had the ability to do something. And the interesting thing about it, of course, is that in the case of African swine fever, the major means of disseminating swine fever throughout Europe has been the migrations of wild boar. And there are two groups of people in Europe who have promoted the free migration of wild boar. And those are hunters and conservation biologists. So it's like, it's, that's why the, the subtitle of the last chapter in our book is, it's nobody's fault but everybody's to blame. Three things that current policies about emerging diseases don't consider. The first is, migrant, the migrants that we need to worry about are not people. With respect to emerging diseases, the problem migrants are not people. They are animals that are moving. They are plants that are moving and bringing their pathogens with them. They are not the people. There, there, are, pro there are potential problems with people moving, but that's not the major problem. It's, and, and the things that are the major problem, you can't build a big enough wall. I'm sorry, I'm an American, I have to bring that up. <laughs> Second, the threat of emerging diseases is not in the hosts that are sick. The threat of emerging diseases is in the, what are called reservoir hosts. These are the hosts that are living happily without disease, with the pathogen. So for example, African swine fever, where does it come from? Uh, Africa? Right. What's it doing in Africa? It lives in warthogs and it causes no disease. And the reality is that most people don't realize that what we don't see can hurt us. This, for example, is all of these red dots on this map are what are called world biosphere sites in Europe. These are places where exotic animals have been transported to Europe for captive breeding. You know what is really difficult to find online about these places right now? How many of them have warthogs? Right here, for example. Here are some in Georgia. That's where African swine fever first was recognized as breaking out into domestic animals. Um, here is this is a Scania nova in Ukraine. And when I visited there a year and a half ago, one of the things we discovered walking through the fields was that the fields are loaded with what are called African hunting ticks, hyaloma, which transmit what is now called Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. So how did the Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever, how did a Congo fever, hemorrhagic fever get to Crimea? Maybe in the zebras and wildebeests and warthogs and the other African species that were transported to Europe for captive breeding by conservation biologists in the name of saving the world from climate change. Now, as far as EU policies with respect to emerging diseases and human migration is concerned, there are three things that we do, and, I, and this is, we're talking about Europe at this particular conference, so I'm focused on Europe, but you have to understand that every country on the planet that is a a place that displaced, humans displaced by economic problems and conflict want to go to. They all have more or less the same kinds of protocols. And there are three problems that we do in the name of, of efficiency and economy. The first is we warehouse people. Okay? If you show up in a migrant camp, an immigrant camp or a refugee camp for admission into Europe and you look sick, you have a fever, you're coughing, you're vomiting, 
you get sent over there. You get put into this large warehouse where there's an enormous number of overworked, understaffed public health people, and everybody is put into the same place with predictable results. So the first report has already emerged of a new kind of antibiotic resistance emerging from those particular kinds of facilities. And we did it ourselves. We knew that we should have known that this was going to happen. We made it happen. The second is that human medical, human health people, veterinary health people, crop health people treat symptoms. They do not treat the causes of the diseases. How many kinds of pathogens cause flu-like symptoms? A lot of them. How many local family physicians can recognize the difference between flu-like symptoms caused by Zika, flu-like symptoms caused by influenza, flu-like symptoms caused by a norovirus, it's just, you've got flu-like symptoms, take some aspirin, go home, drink a lot of water, eventually you'll feel better. So we've grossly underestimated the number of different pathogens that are coming in, which means that we're really underestimating the risk potential. And the third thing we do in the name of economy and efficiency is, if you're not obviously sick, you get passed along. There are three kinds of people who are not obviously sick. One is people who are infected but have not begun to show symptoms, but will. People who are infected but are not diseased, in other words, carriers, genetically resistant carriers. And the third is the people who are not infected. We just assume that if you're not sick, you're not infected, and we send everybody ahead. But at the other end of that, as soon as one of those people gets sick, we immediately assume that it's their fault and they brought the disease in. But the reality is, we made it happen. And the other thing that we don't think about is, we don't pay attention to the genetically resistant carriers of disease in Europe who are be exposing their pathogens to immigrants. So we don't worry too much about the immigrant kids getting sick. We worry about the, 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 the resident kids who get sick because an immigrant comes into their school system. But the reality is it goes in both directions. And this is, again, this is part of this trillion dollars a year cost that we're incurring. And these are things that we could fix now if we wanted to spend the money on doing it. We just clearly don't want to. So it turns out that as far as the medical profession or health professions in general are concerned, the philosophical dictum of do no harm, which is a legacy of the Code of Hammurabi, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that is criminally negligent during a period of climate change. Because do no harm only works if you're never going to, to see anything new and unexpected. And finally, it turns out, and this is different from previous years when I talked about how the time was short and we really should do something, we're out of time. The time is no longer short. We, we have no more time. There's, so the danger is not great, the danger is existential. The survival of technological humanity hangs in the balance. And our job now is not to try to prevent anything, I'm mean, sorry, to, to eradicate anything, to stop anything, to reverse anything. It's to try to survive and try to save as much as we can. Everything we do from this point on is going to be some form of triage. And we have to understand that that we are in a desperate race now to try to save as much as we possibly can. And I will say, again, being an American, I will say that given how large and bureaucratically slow the United States is, if Donald Trump is reelected, the United States will be the first official dead man walking as far as climate change is concerned. It will then be too late 
for the United States to do anything effective. And all they'll be able to do is just wait and hope for the best, which is never a particularly good plan. So <clears throat> that's my 20 minutes. It was bad last year. It's worse this year. And it's going to be worse next year if we don't start doing something. And it's not just disease. I mean, my little slice of the pie is disease, but I could make the same talk about water, about soil depletion, about sea level rise, about atmospheric warming, all of which are happening, all of which have the same sort of trajectory, and all of which interact with each other in complex ways. So, sorry about that. Take care. Thank you, Dan.